Vernon Arnold, and I'm from Southern Oregon. I was born in Medford, 1938, and uh, I grew up in Butte Falls. We lived in the Applegate, though, up on Carberry Creek above Applegate Lake, until I was four. Then we moved to Butte Falls, and I went through school up there. Why did you move to Butte Falls? My dad was a logger, worked in the logging industry, and he got a job up there. It was right after the Depression, you know, and so hard to find Melvin Arnold. Then we moved up there, and then uh, I went to school at Southern Oregon College, got a teaching degree, and taught for a while, 10 years. So now, uh, what do you want me to say next? Oh, go to the picture. I'll just refer to this picture of my dad's side of the family. Ezra, his dad, my dad's dad, is in the picture to the left. Behind in the picture is Fred Bennett. He was a half-brother to my dad. Going across, Uvina Arnold and Elsie Arnold, my grandmother. I never knew either one of the grandparents. Uh, they were gone before I was born. In the middle of the picture is Jim Arnold. And then going across the bottom is Lena Arnold. And then my dad, who was probably about two years old, his name was Melvin Arnold, about two years old, and he was born at Squaw Lake. So the family at this time all lived at Squaw Lake. There wasn't no roads, no, just trails in there. Way back in the, he was born in 1902. So that tells you it goes back a long ways up there. How'd they make their living? He did some mining. He would mine and go over the hill to Elliott Creek, near the Fur Glade, not Fur Glade, but the Blue Ledge Mine, but not, not the Blue Ledge Mine. He'd mine over there in the summer and come back in the winter and they grew a big garden and they also uh, raised cattle, or a few cows and pigs and what have you. So they had, they were pretty much self-sustained. My grandmother, or not my grandmother, my great aunt, who's in this picture, uh, her name was Eubina Arnold, I just mentioned. She was born in 1862 or three, right in there. And she wrote, she lived up until she was about nine or 10 years old. And she wrote a story about it. It's in the Historical Society, a book on what it was like living up there. Very interesting story of her life. And then she went on, because she moved out of the area, moved up to Idaho, then back to the family ranch in Iowa. But her husband was out here mining and found her. He was about 20 years older than she was. <laughs> but anyway, that's the Arnold family. My dad uh, worked at various, yeah, I'll mention this. My dad worked at, uh, at several uh, mines around. He worked at the Blue Ledge Mine, the copper mine, the big one up in the Applegate. He, uh, he went through school about the eighth grade. Then they discovered a mine when he was about 13 years old up in the Applegate, upper part of the Applegate. It was, it's, it's now called the Arnold Mine. I'm just gonna hold this up to refer to it. And I wrote a book because it was discovered in 1915 and we had a 100th anniversary two years ago celebrating the mine and it's a beautiful area. I used to go up there and do assessment work with my uncle who's in this picture too, <laughs> Jim Arnold, and uh, enjoyed it as a kid, go up there for a month at a time, this time of year when it was rainy and cold sometimes. So were the mines very profitable? Well it was a hard rock gold mine. During the depression, in the early 30s, they build a small stamp mill up there. Drug everything in by horse or whatever, mules, what have you, all the equipment. And they had a tunnel that went back in the mine. This book describes all that. It went back in the mine and they had a ledge of quartz about two feet wide that went down in the mountain and the gold's in that quartz. In order to get out of the quartz, you have to crush it up into fine sand and mix it with things to get the gold out of it, yes. And they were able to extract the gold. It got enough to keep them going. Not, it didn't look like very much money, but in those days it was a lot of money because they no jobs. And that's when I lived on the Carberry Creek up here because he would go from that ranch up to the mine, hike in about nine or 10 miles, work it. Even during the winter, they go in on skis, work the mine, come back with the gold. And what little they raised on the farm and the gold they got, 
were able to live. Perfect. So where did they get the water? The wa they had a stream that came, we call it Bean Gulch, came right down by there, and they had to have water to flush the gold out and stuff. And how did they engineer the stamper? This, so there's different designs for that stamper. Yeah, I've got a picture in the thing over here that shows how a stamp mill works. But anyway, they uh, they put it together, and then they had a small. They were gonna they were gonna use a water wheel, but they decided against it, I guess. And they got a little small engine up there, and they had a belt. And what it does, it stamps up and down like this. It has things that pull them up and drop. And, and they would bring the ore from up there at the mine above them, down by ore cart, pull it. They they take a full one and pull an empty up, and then fill that one up and pull the empty up, and they crush the ore into fine sand there, and that's how they extracted the gold. Now since then, I'll just mention briefly, my dad retired in 1967, and before that he started building another stamp mill. The remnants are still up there, and it's all fallen down, there's pictures in the book here. But it's all fallen down, but he built this great big, much heavier duties, two-stamp mill, a great big building. It's amazing what he did. We would go up and help him as we could. We were working and so on. But he built that, never did run very much ore through it because by the time he got ready to run it, he got too old. And so when he was about 85, I think was about the last time he was up there. So did you carry on mining on weekends? Was it like a... Yeah, it was more of a family, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I didn't, I never got the mining bug, so the gold didn't excite me that much. But my dad had that bug, and he wanted to get that gold out and around. Were there a lot of people with that bug? Not too many in those days, because the jobs were pretty plentiful in the 70s and 80s and so on. So no one, nowadays, they're thinking about going back and mining it again. <laughs> we still have it in the family. Uh -huh. Kind of like fracking, going yeah. back and looking at it again. So that's my dad's brief history, you know, and he lived, lived up there. Of course, we grew up in New Falls. When he retired, he moved down to Roosh, out right down here. And that way they could get to the mine a little easier. Well, anyway, that's my dad's side of the family. Now I want to tell you about my mother's side. I'm going to talk about my mother's side of the family now. And they came to the Applegate. My grandfather came there in 18, I've got him on the 1860 census mining out here by Roosh Forest Creek. And then about 19, or 1878, he married my great-grandmother, who I knew. Her name was Sadie DeWolf. Sadie, excuse me, Sadie Collings. His name was Freeman Oscar Collings. Her name was Sadie Collings. And the interesting thing about her, and I have him in the picture here, he's here, this is her, he was about 30 years older than her. He was born in about 1820, or no, 1830. She was born in 1862. The interesting thing about her is she was half Indian. Her mother was an Indian. Her father was a white person, and they were, she was born in the Henley Hornbrook area, 1862. So that's kind of an interesting history about the two of them. And they raised a pretty good sized family. You can see the, and this isn't all the kids. There were a couple more that aren't in the picture. One was born after this, and I think one wasn't in the picture. But I wanna, uh, but anyway, they lived on the ranch where they had a ranch just up from the Applegate River on Squaw Creek. My uncle took me up, up to Squaw Lake one time and he said, we were all born right here, and he pointed to the area where they were born. Now it's all under the lake. But anyway, uh, that was interesting. I'm glad I got that history. And then we came back to the ranch, and he said, a lot of our people were buried here on the ranch. And he took me up to the little grave yard that was up, there's a big two-story house that my uncle built, John was Collins. Was for that house? I don't remember it. If there was probably a route something. But it's right across, it's this side of Copper Store. It's not up by Copper Store. There's a swinging bridge that went across. Some people I talked to here remember the swinging bridge. And uh, we'd go across the swinging bridge to the ranch house. And uh, up behind it was this graveyard. And he pointed out the, the gravestones were all gone. I think they were all wooden at the time. And they all deteriorated. But the graveyard uh, had about 10, 12 people in it. 
and uh, they had to move all those because it was under it's under Applegate Lake now. And they were all family. All family. No, no, some of them weren't. Some of them were friends of the family. A couple of them were in the Civil War, and he pointed those out to me. I've got a list of them if you ever want it. But anyway. Uh, it was interesting finding where that gravesite was. Uh, they had a nice spring there that fed the ranch. This is a little side story. Three years ago, the water was very low. We decided we'd go up there and see if we could find any remnants of the old house or anything. And I walked down there, you could see some of the old house, the concrete foundation. So I was kind of excited about that and the water was just lapping in the edge of it so the lake wasn't completely down but i said they used to have a spring it was right over here and i looked over and here was water bubbling up <laughs> that sent chills down my back because it was a wonderful spring and it was still bubbling there i'm going to try to go up there again if the lake goes low again but anyway they all lived on the ranch uh, some of them moved away but there's a lot of brothers and sisters this one right here is my grandmother she was born 1879 there at the ranch. And I'm going to tell you one side story here too. Her mother, uh, I told you, was half Indian. When she was about eight years old, the story was she got a severe case of measles. It left her deaf. And she raised all these kids, never could hear a sound. So I remember her because she lived in 92. She lived with her daughter, my grandmother, in Medford. And I remember her talking with kind of a sign. She would kind of mumble and talk. And her son came down and talked to her, and he could talk the same language. I think it was kind of, it might have been an Indian sign language of some sort, because her mother was Indian. So she never went away to school? No, uh, like no, not that we know of. Probably they created that language themselves. But anyway, they had a, it was a nice life and so on. I could go on and on, but I don't want to keep up. There's one story I want to tell about this picture of grandfather born in 1830. You notice his face is kind of scratched off. And I got this picture, I'd never seen it before until I was uh, out of high school. And s somebody in the Applegate here said, you might like this picture of your grandparents. I said, I'd never seen a picture of him before, ever. And that, so I took it and I kept wondering why, she said somebody damaged his face. Well, I didn't think anything about it. Then I went down and visited a cousin that lives in California, her mother, was this lady over here and she said I got some old pictures I said well I'd like to take a video I took a video camera and aimed down and let them go through their pictures that's how I used to do it and her mother was probably in her 80s and she would point out certain things they had a picture exactly like this it was an original kind of picture it was scratched off in the exact same spot and that hasn't been photographed that way it was scratched up so I taught, this is the other side of the story, and I can't verify this. No one knows. I have a cousin that lives in Butte Falls. He's eight. He's almost 90. He lived in the Carberry Creek when I lived up there, so this is early on. So he remembers some of the stories. Of, and he, had a good, he has a good memory. Harold Arnold is his name. And he said, I heard a story up here on the Applegate. He said, a guy had cancer on his nose, and this Indian woman made a poultice out of, she went around and picked up plants and so on and made a poultice and put it on his nose and cured it. So I have a hunch he was left with a hole there and they did, and it, they were embarrassed by the picture. It sounds logical, doesn't it? That's my last story. <laughs>
my son said, I want to commemorate him somehow or other. He said, I'm going to etch something in a block of wood that says, in honor of Melvin Arnold or something and put it up on top. So he did that. A couple of years later, he came to me and he said, why don't we change the name of the mountain? I said, I don't know how to do that. How could you change the name of a mountain? He said, well, if anybody can do it, you can. <laughs> I was worked at the historical site. I was president of the board for a while and so on. So I kind of knew uh, people. So I uh, got some information, started filling out the forms. Five years later, it might have been five, might have been four years later, they said there's no other, there's a lake peak, there's a lake mountain around here. This is Lake Peak. We don't need two lake. They said, and you have history that goes back a hundred years here. Let's rename it Arnold Mountain. And they renamed it. It's now on all the maps as Arnold Mountain. But where did Collings Mountain go? Collings Mountain came from this Collings family. The Collings Mountain is just because Freeman Oscar was there and his wife, Betsy Lewis at that time, Betsy Collins, wait a minute, S Sarah Collings, <laughs> his wife Sarah Collings, were there for so long in that Applegate Lake area that they decided when they started naming mountains, I don't know how they got it, but they just decided they would name it Collings Mountain after that, after our family. So it just picked up that name and I don't know how it got its name. I never tried or did anything about it. It was already on the map years before I was born. So anyway, two, two families that I'm associated with the Applegate and I have two mountains named after our family. Nobody can claim that, can they? <laughs> Thank you. Great job. <laughs>